welcome to MSU's Now. And MSU's Now was developed at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, or better known back then, it's just coronavirus, right? And um, uh, we began MSU's Now at that time to share monthly updates. And, you know, things have obviously gotten to a point where there's not much new to discuss about COVID, so we want to get back into just regular programs. So MSU's Now has multiple meanings. And um, so what are we talking about? We're talking about MS Now. All right. So, um, uh, you know, what's happening. So for those that don't know, for those that are online, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I'm president and founder of MS Views and News. And I, too, am a person living with multiple sclerosis. Another story. Um, tonight's sponsors, we have Biogen, Genetech and Santa Fe. And we want to give them all a virtual round of applause. So clap your hands, everybody. I can't hear you, but clap your hands anyway. All right. Great. All right. So our presenter tonight. As a guy that a lot of people know, especially if you're in the South, especially if you're in Georgia, especially if you pay attention to what's been going on online for the last, you know, two years. I mean, Dr. Thrower has been there. He speaks a lot for MS Views and News, of course, with the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation and other organizations as well. But Dr. Thrower is here tonight to talk about gait issues. And a lot of people say, well, what's gait issues? Well, it's your walking problems, you know, and um, I can go into the to the description of that. But. That would only take away from Dr. Thrower's slides. So I'm going to let him talk about it instead. All right. So Dr. Thrower is going to speak for about 40 minutes. Okay. And then I'm going to come back online and I'm going to take your questions. Awesome. Thank you, Stuart. And thank you to all your staff there. You guys do a wonderful job. Um, so as Stuart said, we're going to talk about walking issues in MS. And, and so walking issues kind of goes into that broader area of symptom management. And it, it is one of my favorite things to talk about. We've made great advances in terms of disease modifying therapies, understanding the immunology of MS. Sometimes we forget that we can make a big impact on people's quality of life right here and right now by managing symptoms. And so we want to make sure that we focus on some of those things. So how common are walking issues in people with MS? This was a survey from NARCONS, the North American Research Committee on MS. They looked at a large sample of folks with MS. And as you kind of divide the little pie chart up, the thing that I would call your attention to is actually the, the, the top right-hand corner slice of the pie, the normal slice. In this survey, only 15% of people with MS actually reported having no walking issues. And so 85% did have some trouble with their walking. So when you think about gait dysfunction or walking problems, really you can divide most walking issues in MS into one of five things and realize you may have some of all of these, you may deal with two or three of them. So just because you have one doesn't mean you can't have the others. And the, the trick for the MS community and for the, the healthcare community is to sort out for you individually which of these things are impairing your walking ability. So we're gonna to touch bases a little bit on spasticity. We're gonna talk about foot drop, nerve fiber fatigue, sensory ataxia, and cerebellar dysfunction. And we'll go into what these different uh, terms mean. So spasticity, spasticity comes from the Greek term spastikos, meaning to draw or to tug, it means your muscles are literally pulling or, or drawing up. Uh, it is a motor, not a sensory problem. The fancy uh, medical term for uh, if uh, a medical student is taking an exam for the definition of spasticity is velocity dependent increased resistance to passive stretch. What that means in real life is if you're trying to say move your arm and you tend to have increased flexor tone in your arm, if we move your arm slowly, it's less likely that those muscles are gonna tighten up. If we pull quickly, it's more likely that those muscles are going to, to resist that, that movement. Along with this, we see exaggerated deep tendon reflexes um, and hyperexcitability of, of when we tap on your, on your knees. So the little cartoon uh, man here, this would be classic uh, spasticity. So you see that he's carrying his arm in a flexed position. So uh, spasticity tends to cause increased flexor tone in the arm and his leg on the affected side on his left side tends to be stiffened out or straight. So you have extensor tone in the legs. Uh, one of the things that we see with spasticity is clonus. So many of you may experience this. You get your foot or leg in just the right position and suddenly your leg is bouncing all over the place. 
that's clonus. What you're doing is you're making your deep tendon reflex, the same thing that we get when we tap on your knee, you're making that reflex fire over and over again in kind of an electrical arc. There's nothing dangerous about it. It's a nuisance. You move your leg, get into a different position, and it's gonna stop. But that's a form of increased muscle tone or spasticity. Um, we can have an impairments in control of skeletal muscle. You'll see the cartoon gentleman, his leg is kind of stiffened out. A lot of people with spasticity in the legs will feel like their foot is glued to the floor because that spasticity is driving that foot down. So a lot of times we end up with these alterations in the way that you're gonna walk rather than the leg going in a normal to and fro, to and fro motion, it, it's sort of needed to swing out and around. So when we say spasticity, we would automatically assume that it's all bad. Interestingly, spasticity can have some positives. It can help you maintain your posture and your walking. So if your legs want to stiffen out when you stand up and you've got weakness underlying that, you may actually be using a little bit of that extensor tone to help with transfers and with walking. If we do something to get rid of all of that tone, we've gotten rid of your spasticity, we may have actually made you less functional, though we may actually impair your walking or your, your ability to transfer by doing that. Um, so one of the things we like to do is to get some help from our physical therapy colleagues to help us judge on this balance of good versus bad, where are you at and how aggressive should we be in going after your spasticity. So we typically think of kind of a step ladder approach in terms of how we manage spasticity. At the, the base, something we wanna do in everyone is removing noxious stimuli, taking away things that would annoy your body in a way that it would, uh, would increase spasticity. And we'll talk about some of the, what those, those noxious stimuli are. Physical therapy, we're big believers in physical therapy as something that should be done early and often in managing spasticity. We go up into our oral medications and then intrathecal backup and we'll touch bases on as well. So noxious stimuli, things that could, that could happen to your body that might increase your, your spasticity, basically anything that knocks you off your game. Urinary tract infections would be high on the list. Women who are having their period, their spasticity can increase during that period of time. If your bowel function is thrown off, if you're stressed, if you're sleep deprived, anything that just throws you off your game can increase your spasticity. So again, we mentioned rehabilitation. You know, we want you to, if you're dealing with any increase in muscle tone, we want you to stretch, stretch some more and then stretch a little bit more after that. Stretching can be divided into static stretching. That's what the physical therapist is doing to this person. They're doing the stretching uh, for you while you're lying there, uh, kind of what we call passive range of motion. And then there's something called dynamic stretching where you're actually going through a, a, a motion and stretching at the same time. You know, we traditionally use our physical therapy colleagues to help us get you set up with a good stretching program. There are freestanding facilities out there now that participate in dynamic stretching. So you go to one of these places, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you can have them focus on the arms, the legs, the whole body, and they will work with you for 30 minutes, really putting you through a good stretching program. Uh, massage Envy, uh, there's one here in Atlanta called the Stretch Zone. The Orange Theory, the exercise facility has opened up some of these facilities. So these are places that you can kind of add to your stretching kind of uh, regimen to help you get some, some really good range of motion. And then are the whole other host of things that the therapist uh, use as well, uh, including things like serial casting, where if you have a lot of uh, almost contractures in a joint, and we just, it, we're not gonna be able to stretch that out with regular physical therapy sessions. We can put that joint in a cast and then change the, the, the angle of that cast a little bit at a time over several weeks to really help that joint stretch out. So medications, the, the two most commonly used medications for spasticity are gonna be baclofen and tizanidine. The general rule with baclofen and tizanidine is start with a low dose, go slowly upwards until one of two things happens. 
either you're happy or you're sleepy. Uh, happy means you're satisfied with the degree of spasticity control you've got. Sleepy is obviously sleepy. I would add with baclofen, there's another potential uh, dose limiting uh, side effect, and that can be weakness. Sometimes as we go up on the dose of baclofen, we get the muscles looser, but we make you ragdollish, so you're too floppy now, and we need to back off a little bit. Benzodiazepines, these are your, your di um, Valium, Diazepam, Clonopin, Clonazepam, Ativan, um, can, are definitely muscle relaxants, not our favorite class of drugs to use just because of potential for, for tolerance or addiction, but they, they, they do have a place in the toolbox. Dantrolene, uh, a medication that seems to work better, in my opinion, in, in spinal cord injury than MS, but some, some folks with MS do get some benefit. Keppra or Labotiracetam for muscle uh, spasms more than spasticity, and then we could spend a whole hour just talking about medical marijuana or cannabinoids. So in, in with cannabinoids, you do have the synthetics like Marinol, which is a synthetic THC, which is FDA approved for nausea, uh, but also can be potentially used to, to manage uh, spasticity and spasms. And then something that's in uh, testing right now, uh, phase three studies with Sativex or Nabiximols, uh, we're doing research uh, with this this product. A little uh, sublingual spray of a one-to-one -one mixture of CBD and THC. We know this stuff works. It's been approved by regulatory agencies in other countries for about 10 or more years now. We're, we just have to go through the hoops of getting our FDA to approve it and our DEA to take THC off of the Schedule One list so that things like this can be approved for use in, in MS and other conditions. Um, and then again, at the, as we kind of move up that step, uh, treatment step ladder, intrathecal baclofen, if we bathe your spinal cord in concentrated liquid baclofen, uh, it is a very effective uh, antispasmodic uh, uh, agent. By doing the concentrated liquid baclofen, we don't have the baclofen actually going into the brain itself, which is where the sedation comes from. So we seem to get more of the good without the bad. Obviously, this is a surgically implanted pump, so we, we need to think about the, the risks along with the benefits. Usually, people that are candidates for this uh, for a baclofen pump are going to have a trial, some sort of test run to see if it does what you want it to do before you have that surgically implanted. Foot drop, I would say this is one of my favorite things to talk about because I think it is horribly underappreciated as a cause of walking issues in MS. So the two weakest muscles in people with MS in the legs are gonna be the ability to get your foot up off the ground, that's weakness in your ankle dorsiflexors and your hip flexors. If it was only your foot drop, if it was only the ankle dorsiflexors that were weak, you would do something called a steppage gait. You would bring your foot up higher by flexing your hip so that your foot's not dragging. The problem with MS is if you have ankle dorsiflexor weakness, you probably have hip flexor weakness. So you can't do this. You can't do a steppage gait. So what ends up happening is the foot wants to drag. So people end up doing something called circumduction. They swing their leg out and around in kind of a circular fashion so that they don't drag their toes. And many people are not even aware they're doing this. You know, a person with MS who is maybe fatigued later in the day, I would tell friends and family, watch them walk and see if one leg is going in the normal sort of to and fro pattern and the other leg is swinging out. That's a comp compensatory strategy for foot drop. The problem with circumduction is now you're using muscles to walk that you weren't designed to use. And you're going to fatigue very quickly when you do that. You're also putting stress on your knee and your hip and your lower back. Traditionally, we treat foot drop with an ankle foot orthotic. We'll go to the next one. Unfortunately, many people don't like ankle foot orthotics. They do work, but they are, we, some of the common complaints we hear is that it's so wide that it doesn't fit in the shoes I want it to fit in. Um, it's everybody can see it. They know I've got it on. If I'm in Florida or Georgia, and somewhere warm in the summer and I have shorts on or a skirt on, people know I have it on and it's rigid. So if you're wanting to drive, for instance, and it's on your right foot, it's kind of hard to you know, have that normal push down on the brake or gas. You've got to really use the whole leg to do that maneuver. There are alternatives out there to ankle foot orthotics though. So this is a lighter weight device, a toe off device. You can see it doesn't have as much material around it. Um, so these can be, a, and it's a little more flexible, a little narrower, might fit in more shoes that you want it to fit in. 
some over-the-counter devices. This is a very simple, inexpensive device called the Dorsey Strap. Um, I've got the website on there. Um, Pre-inflation, I've not checked it here recently, it used to run about 40 bucks, it's probably a little more expensive now. Basically soft collar around your ankle, ties into the part of, top part of your shoe, and just gives you some lift. It's not gonna give you any lateral support, but it may give you just enough lift uh, to do what you want it to do. Where I see this fitting in is if someone has mild foot drop and maybe they're going to Disney World and they're gonna be doing a lot of walking, maybe something like this will, be just, will fit that bill for something you need just for longer distances. This device is, is uh, the same idea as the Dorsey strap, but this one's kind of on steroids. I actually like this device better, uh, a little more expensive, uh, about 150 bucks thereabouts. That collar is comfortable and it is it will last a long, long time. These are little micro steel cables that tap into your, your shoe. There, that knob on the front is a tensioning device. You can crank that up as much or as little as you want. I have people who hike in these. They're, you know, they're, they're pretty sturdy. So again, this, this may be something appropriate for some people. And then next slide, there's some other companies that make different versions of this stuff. If you Google you know, devices for foot drop, you'll see a lot of other companies. But I would say we, we tend to use the, the probably of the over-the-counter ones, we probably use the Sabo device the most. Then we get into the, the realm of functional electrical stimulation. What if we can make the nerve to those ankle dorsiflexors work again? So we've known for 150 years, if we stimulate your perineal nerve on the outside of your knee, we can make those muscles work again and make your foot come up. How do we turn that into something functional? So one of the devices that's out there is the WalkAid device. Uh, they've upgraded, there's a, a version 2.0 out right now. I would say of the, the two devices, we'll show the next one now as well, the Bionest device is the other device. Our therapists generally prefer this, this one, the Bionis. It's It is a little bit more adaptable to the needs of a person with MS. Um, it reads your environment. The original Bionis device had a clip on your shoe. Uh, it was a little radio telemetry device. They've gotten rid of that, so it's it, everything is from the knee up. Um, this should, you know, as your your level of weakness changes through the day, this should adapt to that and read your you know your environment and read how much you know when when the stimulator needs to fire or not. So, uh, the, you know, with any of these devices, I think one of the real keys is you've got to get in with a therapist who's familiar with it, let them put it on you, let you trial it for a you know, good little bit so you know if it works the way that you want it uh, to before you, we make any kind of commitment. Um, these are not inexpensive pieces of equipment. If you get the whole Bionis set up, um, it's running to the, in the tune of about $8,000. This is what this what it looks like in real life. This was a, an individual we worked with here at Shepherd Center on the um, first part. She's using her ankle foot orthotic and a walker, and to go 10 meters, it took her uh, 90.75 seconds, so a minute and a half to go 10 meters. She trades out her ankle foot orthotic for the Bionis device, and she cuts that in half uh, or less. So you know she's walking twice as fast by using the appropriate piece of equipment. She's still using her walker, um, but, but she's able to do it a whole lot faster now. So this is brand new. This uh, uh, device got FDA clearance just about uh, a month and a half ago. This is the Psionic Neural Sleeve. It's that black neoprene uh, piece of equipment on the person's leg there. Um, it is a functional electrical stimulation device for, for foot drop, uh, but it's just using some different technology. Um, it sounds really exciting. I will say we have not seen this in, in real life quite yet. Uh, it is slated for commercial release in the fall. We have a uh, demo set up here at Shepherd Center sometime in the next few weeks. When we say that something's FDA cleared, that's different from saying it's FDA approved. Cleared means that they don't see any safety concerns with it, it's not gonna hurt anybody. Doesn't necessarily mean that they signed off on the effectiveness of the device. And I think the reason they cleared it and not authorized it is that the study was relatively small. It was 70 individuals and it was not all people with MS. It was a mixture of individuals with MS, stroke, spinal cord injury, cerebral palsy, 
the, the results were impressive in that small group, 143% improvement in foot drops. So stay tuned. I, yeah, hopefully this is going to be a nice addition to our, our uh, uh, toolbox and fighting back against foot drop. Nerve fiber fatigue. So nerve fiber fatigue, if you have any issues with heat sensitivity, you get weaker or you have other symptoms act up with heat exposure, or you just poop out, you know, when you exercise, you get on a treadmill or you do some other exercise and the longer you do it, the harder it gets to do it. The underlying uh, basis of that is nerve fiber fatigue. Nerve fiber fatigue is an electrical phenomenon. On the top here, this is the way myelinated nerve fiber should act. We've got the, the insulation, the myelin over the nerve fiber, and you see the little pinched areas, the gaps there, those are called nodes of Ranvier. Those are gaps in the myelin, and normally the electrical uh, information jumps from gap to gap to gap. It's called saltatory conduction, very fast, very efficient way of getting information from point A to point B. Now MS comes along and unfortunately strips that myelin away, and so you no longer have saltatory conduction. Now you have to reconduct that electrical uh, information in little baby steps. It works, but it's not as effective as it used to be, and that area of demyelination is prone to conduction block. If you get overheated or you use that naked nerve fiber again and again, electrically you've drained the battery. It's important to realize you're not hurting anything, you're not damaging anything, you're not causing MS progression, you've just drained the battery temporarily, you cool off, rest, relax, and you should be good to go again. So what do we do for nerve fiber fatigue? Well, we fight back against the heat with cooling vests. You know, some of the newer cooling vests are really slick. Uh, MS, uh, MS Association of America, uh, Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, or MS Focus, uh, both have uh, cooling vest programs where you can get great cooling vests free of charge. Uh, for aminopyridine and dalfampyridine, very similar molecules. Uh, the the former, the formenopyridine, is a mom and pop compounded pharmacy drug. It's been around forever. We still use this. Um, both of these molecules work on potassium channels on that naked nerve fiber. They're not repairing the damage. They're just letting you go longer before you, hit the, you drain the battery. One of the mysteries to us with formenopyridine and dalfampyridine is why don't they work for everybody with MS? In reality, they seem to work in about 40% of people. If you start one of these, they're both oral medications, twice a day uh, uh, oral medication, you'll know in four weeks if you're a responder or a non-responder. If we give someone a four-week trial and they see nothing with it, we usually call it quits at that point. We don't understand the physiology of why people don't respond, but it, that happens. Sensory ataxia is one of the other uh, things that, that messes with people's walking. Ataxia means you kind of walk like you had a drink too many. Sensory means you do it because you don't have normal proprioception. You don't feel changes in position in different joints, uh, usually below the knees, but it can be at the knees itself. So it's, it's sort of you know, the, the um, uh, we, we joke that, you know, we see T-shirts and stickers around that, and people with MS say, I'm not drunk, I have MS, because people look like they've had a drink too many. I have a funny couple that the, the wife has MS, and her T-shirt is, I'm not drunk, I have MS, and the husband's shirt is, is I don't have MS, I'm drunk. Next slide. So what happens with sensory ataxia? How do people compensate for it? One of the ways that people compensate for it is they put their feet further apart, so they have a broader base, so they're less likely to, to fall. We joke about improvised assistive devices. People know where the walls are, where the furniture are, where their, you know, their, their significant other or friend next to them, they're gonna use that person to hang on to. Shopping carts, big pets, uh, or can be improvised assistive devices. And then we have official assistive devices, seems like canes and walkers. Unfortunately, sometimes if the compensatory mechanisms don't work out, we see falls. One of the things that we really counsel people on is if your balance is off and your walking has been affected due to sensory ataxia, one of the things that your brain is gonna do as a compensatory mechanism is use the visual horizon. You're using your eyes to see if you're tilting or not. Don't take your visual cues away from yourself. Doing something as, as minor as looking at the person next to you when you're walking and taking your eyes off the visual horizon can put you off balance. Getting up in the middle of the night with no lights on, 
standing in the shower with your eyes closed to wash your face or hair. You know, these are situations where you're, you're at higher risk for falling because you've taken those visual cues away. So what do we do for sensory ataxia? Physical therapy uh, to work on balance, and a lot of times we're focusing on core strengthening. What we know is that with core strengthening, we're not fixing the lack of sensation, but we're letting you adapt to it a lot more quickly. Hippotherapy, I love hippotherapy. I wish it was available uh, more places. Hippotherapy is physical therapy on horseback. There are physical therapists who are certified in this more specialized form of therapy. We have a great uh, resource here in Atlanta, the, the Chastain Horse Park, where these are physical therapists that we can write a prescription for, send someone there. Insurance will pay for it for whatever length of time they would normally cover physical therapy. And it works because you're really, you're focusing on that core strengthening and you're simulating walking. When that horse is moving, your pelvis is moving just like you're walking. And when you're sitting up on that horse, you're really being forced to engage all of those normal core muscles and, and really improve your, your uh, balance quite a bit. And then we talked about some of the adaptive equipment. Cerebellar dysfunction. So the cerebellum is the primitive back part of our brain that you see in the, the diagram that doesn't control strength or sensation, but it controls how much we move it. So it monitors movements. Uh, next slide. So when you think about when the cerebellum is not working well, the person could have perfectly normal strength, but if it's affecting the upper extremity, we're gonna see the person trying to reach for something and their tremor gets really big as they get close to that object and they have a hard time stopping right where they want to stop. There's truncal ataxia, so the person has a hard time maintaining a, a, an upright posture because they, they just can't keep that one position. These things can affect the walking also. So we pe see people that have an ataxic gait. This is not the sensory ataxia we talked about before. This is cerebellar ataxia. And then there can be speech disturbances. People that have cerebellar dysfunction, they have what we call loss of prosody. Normally we have this normal sort of intonation to our voice where there's a, a kind of a, a up and down normal flow. People with cerebellar dysfunction lose that normal intonation and so they hit highs where maybe there should have been a low. And sometimes their speech has this kind of almost a scanning, it can even have kind of a monotonous sound where there's no intonation, no highs or lows. So what do we do for cerebellar dysfunction? I think you've seen one of the themes through a lot of this is you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy covers a lot of these bases. So we rely pretty heavily on our, our therapy colleagues to, to work with just about any MS problem that's throwing you know, a, a, a problem into walking. Medications for tremor, I wish we had better ones. Uh, we do use an old medication called primadone or mycelene. It's an old seizure medication. Um, it helps a little bit. Uh, there is some data out there suggesting that, that cannabis can potentially help with cerebellar uh, tremor. And then there's deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation is a little uh, almost pacemaker type device that's surgically implanted uh, just over the collarbone with small electrodes that travel through you know, uh, under the skin, up the neck, and then drop in uh, at, through the uh, kind of the parietal area on your skull into a part of the brain called the thalamus. The thalamus is the relay station for your cerebellum. And so sometimes we can override some of the tremor that we see with cerebellar uh, dysfunction by electrically stimulating the thalamus. If you go on YouTube and look up some of these surgeries, it, it's, it's really pretty amazing. The surgery is done. It is a brain surgery and it's done while the person is awake. When you think about what hurts uh, from the neck up, it's really the skin and the soft tissue structures. Once you numb those things, you can touch the brain and there's no discomfort associated with that. So once we have the person numbed up so there's no discomfort, small hole drilled in the skull, this electrode then is dropped into the thalamus. The reason you want the person awake is you want to know when you've got that electrode in the right place. So let's say the person has a left-handed tremor. You're going to have them doing things with that left hand. You're going to drop the electrode in, and when the tremor gets better, you know you've got it in the right place. So again, kind of a very specialized form of treatment for cerebellar dysfunction, but you know, it's good, good to know there are things like this out there. So some other options, we're gonna talk about um, some robotic aids that are out there and some, uh, some newer rehab approaches. 
So some of these robotic things, so these are, are in the realm of what we call exoskeletons. If you have weakness from MS, spinal cord injury, stroke, um, and this is typically going to be a person who's got weakness in, in both legs. There are different companies working on robotic devices, uh, robotic exoskeletons. You can't see it on the person's back here, but there is a motor that's actually driving that, that unit uh, to help move their legs. So this Cyberdyne system is, is one of them. Uh, Kyogo, another uh, exoskeleton system, and then the next one is one we're doing research here at Shepherd with called the Indigo uh, exoskeleton. Uh, this gentleman is actually uh, an employee here at, at Shepherd who's had a spinal cord injury and a motorcycle accident, and he was part of our research with uh, the Indigo exoskeleton. They're getting better and better. The One of the challenges has been how easy these things are to, uh, to take on and, and uh, put on and take off, and then how heavy the motor is. Early on in research, some of the motors on these units were just too heavy. They weren't practical. I mean, Lord help the person if they fell down, they're like a turtle now. They're just, there's no way they're going to be able to get back up themselves. This is uh, a newer rehab technique that we're doing research on here called FES bikes, functional electrical stimulation bikes. So these are stationary bikes. Uh, there, there's nothing really special about the bike itself. What's special is the, the FES system. So these individuals have electrodes on their legs. So as they're using that stationary bike, as they start fatiguing, they're, they're there is a motor assist that can help a little bit with their pedaling, but more importantly, the FES system is going to stimulate their muscles for them. So if they're not able to get signal from brain to spinal cord to muscle, the FES system is going to say, I got this for you. I will fire the muscles. The question that researchers had with this type of training is, does using this translate into better strength and endurance in the real world. And in multiple studies, it has been shown to, to uh, translate into better endurance and better strength. So we, we do uh, uh, FES training classes for, for appropriate individuals with, uh, with MS here at Shepherd Center. And then this is also brand spanking new. Um, this is the PONS Neural Stimulator. Um, the, a lot of this original research came from the Department of Defense, uh, looking at, at individual soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan who had had spinal cord injuries, traumatic brain injuries, typically IED explosions. And the idea is trying to build neural plasticity. So when we think about ways of recovering function in a, in a person with MS or other neurological conditions, we can certainly look at remyelination, we can look at axonal regeneration, or we could work, look at maybe just rerouting. What if we don't actually repair the damage? What if we just build a highway around it? We build, build a detour, and that's what this pond system is. So it's a little head unit, and what looks like a microphone that comes that's coming around on the front of that is actually goes under the tongue. And the way that this, these studies were done is that the person received physical therapy with this device in. And what they saw in the, the initial studies is that people with MS got far more benefit using this sort of neural stimulator, in theory, creating sort of neural plasticity uh, detours around areas of damage. They got more results with this than they did with physical therapy by itself. We are in the process of putting this on board uh, right now at um, Shepherd Center. So most MS centers, if you're affiliated with a university or an institution uh, like we are, you have to go through a technology committee. So you, you want to put that in front of a you know, group of people to make sure they think it's safe and reasonable and, and doable for your, your system. And then we'll, we'll put it into to use here at uh, Shepherd. So this may be something you'll see out at, across the country. Just a word on power mobility. You know, sometimes with walking issues, we need to think about scooters and power chairs. And ideally, uh, what I like to see people do when they start thinking about something like this is if you have access to a seating clinic, that's your best route. Uh, so for me to sit in the exam room and say, well, you're more of a scooter person, you're more of a power chair person, that, that is not always a very exact science. I like to get some help from a seating clinic. These are physical therapists who have special training and looking at these devices. Um, there, there are pros and cons to both. 
you know, a scooter is typically a little lighter weight, it's less expensive, it may be easier to transport from, from point A to point B. The downside to the scooter, though, is it doesn't offer a lot of lateral support like a power chair does. So if you don't have good postural tone, if you're at risk for falling out of a chair, it's a lot easier to fall out of a scooter than it is out of a power wheelchair. The other problem with scooters is that they are not modifiable. A scooter is pretty much a scooter is a scooter is a scooter. Whereas a power chair, they can do a lot of things to those. They can custom fit it to you. They can make modifications to it. And that's, again, where the, the, the seating clinic is going to help us out a, a little bit. I would be cautious you know, if you're thinking about power mobility. I would not that stores like the scooter store and hover around. These are not bad places. that They sell good products, but realize that's all they sell, are scooters. So if you go to the scooter store and you have mobility issues, they can sell you a scooter because that's all they sell. So I think it's better to work with an advocate like a seating clinic so that you make sure you're getting what you need. These are not inexpensive pieces of equipment and Medicare has certain requirements for what it takes to qualify for one of these things. And the usual rule of thumb is whatever we prescribe for you and put you in, you're probably gonna be in that for five years unless something drastic happens. The Medicare is not gonna be thrilled about covering another piece of equipment within that five year window. So we want, wanna make sure we get it right. And with that, Stuart, I think that we will turn it over to the uh, the audience and uh, see what see what we want to cover. First off, I want to say bravo. Okay, if I were in if I were in an audience right now, I would have everybody up standing saying thank you for that wonderful wonderful dialogue that you just gave us. I mean, it was out of this world. I don't know if people realize how long it takes you to prepare something like this, and and they should know this is not something you just throw together. This was an unbelievable unbelievable program that we had tonight so i want to i want to thank you okay I, you. I i do i do recognize good 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 work all right <laughs> <laughs> thank you all right and and i'm sure you know we have over 100 people online tonight so that's great we haven't seen this kind of number in months you know due to covid so this was a great topic to have and i'm glad you chose it yes everybody doctor dr thrower asked me if he could speak about this and i said yes that is automatically a great topic for for many to benefit from. So we do have a lot of questions that came in online. So I wanna make mention though about uh, another scooter store. It's called Travel Scoot. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. And um, you know, I think it's great that somebody has, you know, a, a mobility scooter for people that's lightweight. It's only 25 to 35 pounds. It's like made of an aluminum product. Um, so it's easy for people who can't handle a heavier weighted scooter, but the but the problem is the cost and that insurance doesn't cover the cost of this. So it is over twenty four hundred dollars. And and I, I, you know, I just hope it lasts a long time for people. OK. All right. First question. Can you tell us what kind of new equipment there is now for people with foot drop? Yeah, so I think the the upgrades to both the walk aid and the bionis are the are the big ones, and then this new psionic neural sleeve is definitely the newcomer on the market. So I would say stay tuned on the on the neural sleeve. Um, again, I can't emphasize enough. Get you know with these devices, get in with a physical therapist and try these things out. They uh, they can be just game changers in the right individual, but you want to make sure it does what you want it to do before you uh, you or somebody else pays for it. Okay, great. So again, though, with that new neuro sleeve that you were talking about, when do you expect that to be able to get onto the market? So fall of 2022 is is what their their website press release says. Um, and also uh, about that, will similar to that, will this psionic work if you currently wear a K K A F F O brace? It should. You should be able to. Yeah, I mean, work around that. Um, it looks like it's going to stimulate both the, the ankle dorsiflexors and either the knee flexors or extensors, depending upon what the need is. It's not going to work on the hip flexors. That The hip flexor weakness has been is the holy grail of gait dysfunction. No one's quite figured out how to stimulate the, the nerves to, to work on the hip flexors yet, but, but it's going to hit everything below the hip flexors. Great. Thank you for that. And for everybody online, I'm going to be jumping around. I mean, there might be a question asked about something similar to something else. I got MS, all right, and I'm going to forget it because there are a lot of questions here, all right, but I want to just try to get through them as quick as I can because everybody's got things to do tonight. So 
Michael is asking, what about towel patch, T-A-O patch? So towel patch is, you know, I would put in kind of an alternative complementary treatment realm. Um, it gets some, I would say most of what you're hearing is testimonial or anecdotal. Um, we've had a few individuals try it out. It is a caught, it is an expense out of pocket. I, I would say for me, and I'm just being completely honest, I, I'm not sold. I am not convinced. I'm open to people trying it. I think the risk is very low. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's worth a shot, but it, it is not inexpensive. And the data I think is sparse. Okay, thank you. There's a Deborah that's asking, is there anything, any information on the availability of the PONS neurostimulation therapy? Also the neurostimulation leg cuff. I guess that's what you just spoke about. Yeah, so the PONS unit, you're gonna definitely wanna go to a comprehensive MS center. And again, it's gonna take a little bit for it to roll out just because of our stuff that has to go on behind the scenes, the committees, they have to approve it. And it's pretty labor intensive. The way the study was done is these people got physical therapy five days a week. It, we're kind of struggling with that at our end just to say, man, do, do we have the manpower to suddenly accommodate daily physical therapy? There was a range. So at the low end, people got three time a week physical therapy. And, and for us, I know that that's what we're gonna see if we can accommodate three days of physical therapy per week put the pond unit on. Uh, you know, the other questions that nobody has the answer to is insurance gonna pick this up. Uh, it's a new technology. You know, insurance is not always quick to adapt new technologies. And so a lot of lot of questions. Um, I, I would encourage you if you're interested in it, talk to your comprehensive team. If they're not working with it, ask if they are partnering with somebody in the area that, that is. Uh, okay. The neural slave, I think we talked about already. Yes, thank you. By the way, for anybody that has COVID questions, we didn't really get into that because, again, it's pretty repetitive. But um, there are some things that we do have questions for, and we'll get to them later on in the program. Okay. Um, there's a person that just asked, um, I wonder how many MSs wear, wear methodically the foot aids. I have never been able to put it on by myself, so my husband and my husband doesn't have patience every morning to help me. What can you say or... Yeah, of advice. We, she is absolutely right. So we did a little study years ago where we tagged pieces of equipment with a GPS tracking device. And the, 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 the piece of equipment that stayed at home the most was the ankle foot orthotic. People's canes and walkers and wheelchairs and scooters had a great time. They went all over the town. The ankle foot orthotic spent most of their time in the closet. The most common time that people use their ankle foot orthotic was when they came for their doctor's appointment. They did, people put them on to make us happy. Don't do that. If you have a piece of equipment and it's not working for you, you can't get it on, it's not practical, tell somebody, say, hey, this is not working for whatever reason and we need to get you something different. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there's a Katrina asking, can spasticity actually decrease over time? Spasticity, it, anything can happen. And MS waxes and wanes, people have symptoms that come and go. It's unlikely. Typically, once spasticity starts up, it's unlikely that it's going to go away completely. You will have good days and bad days with it, but it's unlikely that just all by itself that it would go away completely for you. I mean, we can't deal with it, but it's probably not going to disappear on its own. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one, Darlene. What kinds of AquaFit exercises can you recommend to strengthen and move easier? So that's going to be very individual. So once you get in the pool, you want an instructor or a physical therapist to look at what your needs are. You know, is it more lower extremity, upper extremity weakness? Is it spasticity? Is it sensory ataxia? So the core weakness. So it's going to be really designed to you as an individual based upon what, what your needs are. I love aquatics therapy. You know, it's it takes the you can't fall and hurt yourself in the pool. Um, so, yeah, if you have access to it, I would say get in there and, and have an instructor work with you and help you design a program. Okay, thank you. Um, continuing a little bit on, on spasticity, can spasticity, spasticity be alleviated with stretching yoga or exercise? Yes, yes, and yes. So the, those are your, you know, other than removing noxious stimuli, all those things that were just mentioned, those want to be at the base of your therapy. Yoga is great because it gives you the stretching. It works on your core strength, on your balance. And there are, you know, there are levels of exercise that can be adapted to anything that a person with MS is dealing with. If you're in a power chair and, you know, 
regular yoga is not appropriate. There's adaptive yoga. So that the trick is just reaching out and finding those things that are going to be you know, appropriate to you. Okay, great. Thank you. And going back again, another question on spasticity. Spasticity, yes. Um, if um, lesions in the spine get better, will the spasticity lessen? Um, again, it, it, it could, but it's unlikely. And so when we say better, realize we're talking probably about things looking better on the MRI and then maybe the weakness getting better. Unfortunately, even when things look better on MRI, if you've had a spinal cord lesion, you, you've still injured the spinal cord, you've still insulted it. And the way spasticity works is it's usually not a problem early on after a new lesion to the spinal cord spasticity evolves over time so it tends to get a little more active the further away from the injury you get and then it'll hit a plateau so again i don't want to sound discouraging i mean there's there's all kinds of treatment and ways we can deal with spasticity but the likelihood that it's going to go away all by itself is, is low and there's really a push right now to try to recognize spasticity we in the medical community have not always done a great job of of addressing, recognizing, and dealing with spasticity, it's probably one of the more under-recognized and under-treated symptoms in, in MS. Thank you. Stephanie says, hi, Dr. Thoreau, I've been tripping a lot. How do I know if I need an AFO? So you know, work with your healthcare team, whether it's you know your neurologist, your PA, your nurse practitioner, that's gonna be your entry point. They're gonna to try to help determine of those five things we talked about that are gonna affect your walking, which, which ones are affecting you individually. And then there's a high likelihood they're gonna to wanna to get you in with a physical therapist. And again, just, just putting these devices on and see. You know, a lot of times it's just a matter of trial and error to see, okay, does it work? Uh, is and you know, is it worth pursuing? And if if let's say the ankle foot orthotic is not for you, then it's something like the Bioness unit or one of these uh, the psionic neural sleeve or, or one of these other devices going to be better for you. Okay. Most people know about wearing an AFO on one foot or leg. Does it? Can a person wear one on each? You can wear bilateral AFOs. You know, one of the challenges if you have an AFO on both feet is that hard plastic surface under your foot where you're not feeling things, you're not feeling position changes. It can really mess with your balance if you take that proprioception away in both feet. So it, it's doable, um, but it's you, you definitely would want to do it with the guidance of a physical therapist. We could actually increase fall risk by using bilateral AFOs. And is it safe to wear them at night? Um, that's so you really don't need to necessarily use it for foot drop obviously because you're not walking at night if you're trying to actually treat to, to prevent extensor sort of spasms and increase your tone so at night if you have an increased extensor tone in your legs your foot's going to want to point down so you can say well i'm going to use the ankle foot orthotic to keep it up you probably don't want to use the afo for that you probably want a brace that's more designed for sleep you know the afos have some hard edges on them if you're sleeping in that it could irritate the skin so there are some devices that are specifically designed to sleep in that are going to be a little bit more comfortable okay thanks if a person um has edema or swelling of the legs or the feet and they can't use an AFO, what can they use instead for foot drop? So the, the Bionis device would certainly be an option, maybe something that doesn't go up over the calf, maybe something that's just down at the ankle, like that Sabo device that's over the counter could be potentially used. We'll see if the neural sleeve is gonna fit, fit with that. And then I think also, you know, is there any way we can get rid of the swelling or at least minimize it? So a lot of times swelling in the legs and MS is due to the weakness. So if we can kind of work on some physical therapy and getting the legs moving, sometimes we mobilize that edema and get it out of the out of the legs. Um, so if there's any way we can minimize the edema, maybe we open up other devices to the person. But if we can't get rid of the edema, then we'll just pick a different device. Okay, thank you. And let's see, um, next one, Aqua Zumba. Do you know anything about these classes for spasticity? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so Zumba is, you know, obviously it was designed kind of a, you know, uh, exercise aerobic type class. And then what they're doing now is just put it in the water. It makes perfect sense. You know, if you've got balance issues, weakness issues, let, let the water address that. Let the water take some of your body weight away. Let it minimize your fall risk. Uh, so, yeah, if you look up, you know, Aqua Zumba, a lot of times you'll find classes near you. You know, when we think about these aquatic programs for people with MS, sometimes these pools are not, they're not just serving the MS community, they're working with people without MS, they may be serving stroke and spinal cord injury. 
check your pool temperature. Um, you know, the, if you look at the National Mess Society website, it says the pool temperature ideally should be 85 degrees Fahrenheit. That feels cool when you get into it. Don't let a, a warmer pool necessarily discourage you from trying it out. That 85 degrees Fahrenheit is a number we've quoted as if it were the gospel. It was based upon a very small study from many, many decades ago. There are plenty of people with MS who may tolerate warmer pool temperatures. Again, just if the pool is say 88 degrees or 90 degrees, get in and try it. If you get out and you feel like a noodle and it sucked all the energy out of you, that was too warm and we can't use that pool. Uh, but don't don't necessarily write off a warmer pool temperature out of hand just because it, uh, you're fearful of it. Hey, thank you. Next, slightly different. Um, Laura writes, do the foot aids also help with hip bursitis? So if you treat your foot drop, you're going to min you're going to lessen the stress that you're putting on your hip. Your hip bursitis may not be all caused from the, the alteration of your walking due to your foot drop, but I'll guarantee you the foot drop's aggravating the heck out of your hip bursitis due to that circumduction. You're swinging that leg out and around. You're putting more stress on the hip. So it might not get rid of it, but it can certainly help it. Hey, thank you. Next one was, does a heap, heap, does a weak hip play into the foot drop or is only a weak leg that will cause that? I think that's based on what you were just saying, but just to amplify it a little bit. Yeah. So the hip flexor weakness is definitely part of the walking issue. And again, those, you could almost bet those two things go hand in hand, the foot drop and the hip flexor weakness. There may be a little bit you know, of more of one than the other, but it, it, they usually do go together. It's pretty rare to see someone who only has ankle dorsiflexor weakness and a totally intact you know, uh, hip flexor. They're, they're usually gonna go both. And then again, with the, you've got the hip flexor weakness and then you've got the stress on the joint also that's gonna cause some hip pain. So we've got to tease all of those things out. Okay, thank you. All right, um, is there anything I could do about a foot spasm while it's happening? So trying to stretch it out, realize that a lot of spasms in the legs are extensor in nature. So you, when you, typically when you stretch, you wanna go the opposite direction. Putting a towel under your foot and just gently, under the ball of your foot, just gently pulling back or having someone push it back. Realize that if you're doing the stretch when you're not spasming or if you're in the midst of a spasm, you gotta go slow and gently. If you have someone pushing on that muscle quickly, it's gonna really you kick that spasm off even more. And when you're stretching or someone else is stretching you, don't ever let them bounce you know, on the muscle. It's just really irritating to the muscle. So just slow and gentle. In, if you can do the stretch yourself, whether you're in the midst of a spasm or not, it's better if you can do it yourself, if it's physically possible. You know how, how far to pull back. Typically with a stretch, you wanna to pull to the point where it's just, you feel like, okay, I can't go any further. It's a little bit uncomfortable and hold it at that point. You know, if you're having to give someone else that feedback and you're not doing it yourself, it's a little bit more challenging. I'll tell you, I get those a lot in the middle of the night and uh, my toes go up in the air and I, I like jump out of bed and I have to stand on my foot with my other foot to even get the arch to relax and the toes just to settle back into place. You want to talk about pain? That's pain. Yeah, it, I don't know if that's from I don't know if it's that from standing on it or just the uh, or just the spasticity at the same time. So. Yeah. All right. It definitely wakes you up. Yeah, Deborah writes. Uh, what are the differences between spasticity and spasms? Good question. Great question. So spasticity is the state of the muscle being tight most of the time. So you're, you know, if you're if you have spasticity in the arm, your arm is going to be flexed most of the time. Uh, a spasm is the wave. So what, what you just described, Stuart, that's a spasm. So spasm is the episodic event. Spasticity is the state of chronically being tight. You may have both. You may have both of those things going on. And, and sometimes the treatment is the same for the two. A lot of times when we look at research for treatments, they're gonna focus more on spasms than on spasticity, like Sativex, the, the uh, medical marijuana that's being researched. They're really focusing on spasm counts because it's a little easier to measure that than it is to, to sort of quantitate spasticity. Sure, there's a person writing about the length of time that she is on her feet 
and, you know, how that causes spasms. I can't agree with that as well. I'm sorry to say, but I can't. But, you know, all the airports and then running around and doing programs and running back and forth and getting questions done and everything else. Yeah, at the end of the day, your legs, your feet just or your legs want to cramp up. So what can be done in advance for people like that um, to limit the uh, what you know is going to happen? Yeah, I think you want to attack that from a lot of angles. I mean, if you can increase your endurance through a regular exercise program, you may tolerate those those length, the standing periods better. When you're standing as much as you can not, don't be static. You know, if you've got a, let's say you're in the kitchen doing something, you move around a little bit. Don't stand in one position for, for more than, say, a minute at a time. Try to take little breaks and move some. Um, and then make sure you're in a regular stretching program to try to head that off at, at the pass. And then we kind of go up into the medications after that. If, if between exercise, stretching, being mindful of, of not standing in a, a static position for too long, if those aren't cutting it, then we're going to get into the baclofen, tizanidine type medications. Okay, thank you. Karen writes, what's the best thing you can do to improve walking if you have short circuiting fatigue for walking? So that's the nerve fiber fatigue that we talked about. Um, and again, that's so if, if there's a heat component, we want to make sure we've got a cooling, uh, some kind of cooling strategy in there um, using the, you know, either the foraminopyridine or the dalfampridine uh, can can help. Uh, you push that that line out in the sand further out. Maybe you're able to walk longer before you hit that that wall. Interestingly, too, exercise programs in and, you know, it's things that improve your strength and endurance. They may let you use less effort so that you have less increase in your core body temperature when you're walking. So, so even though the, you know, we're not repairing the damage with, with exercise, we may let you go further before you, you hit that wall. So just regular physical therapy and exercise program, that FES bike uh, uh, program that we talked about that, uh, that we're doing research on, those are all avenues that might help push that line in the sand out further for her. Okay, thank you. Two people just wrote similar questions. I wonder if they know each other because it just both came in within five minutes, all right? One writes, um, Linda writes, does AP4 need to stay in the system or can it be taken in the morning only? And Karen writes, do you notice patients seeing benefit but taking Ampirid just once a day? Yeah, ideally you'd like to do the the four aminopyridine or the dalfampridine and ampera twice a day, but I do have people who get some benefit with once a day dosing. What you're not going to probably get away with is just taking it sporadically, just taking like one dose, you know, here and there. It it really is a better maintenance medication. I will say the other trick that we've learned is people will be on one of these medicines and they'll say, you know, it worked, and then it feels like it stopped working. Uh, we've had people do little drug holidays, stay on it for you know a few months, take a one week break from it. There's no withdrawal from the medication. You can stop these safely. A lot of the original trials with these drugs were designed purposefully that way. People were taken on and off the drug. So if you, you feel like you're you lose benefit from it, try try taking a break for a week and then go back on it and see if it doesn't pick up its effectiveness again. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I continue with the questions, is a person that is asking how they see the beginning of the program that they miss. Um, like all of our programs that we do online, everything does get edited and then goes onto our YouTube channel. It will be there in less than a week or a week or less than a week or a week, depends on you know how much I could get done during the week, all right? But that's about how long it'll take till it gets online, all right? So it's either less than a week or about a week, all right? But it will be there and what we will do is we'll send out an email to everybody that's on tonight's program to let them know that that it's on our YouTube channel. So that way you can watch it from there. So for anybody online that's taking notes all night, you didn't need to because it'll be coming out and you can uh, and you can, uh, you know, watch it again or share it with others that, you know, as well. OK. All right. Great. So next, I haven't even hit all these questions yet in paper. I mean, we still have online, but I'm going to go through these rather quickly. All right. Um, and everybody, the only reason why we're going through rather quickly is because we have an 8.15 stop time, okay? So um, if you don't need to ask a question at this point in time, don't worry about it. It's probably been asked and answered or is about to happen. All right, so next, uh, are there any new therapies, therapies with regard to spasticity and gait? 
So there is the uh, nabiximols, the Sativex that is in testing. Again, that's the, the uh, CBD THC, not approved yet. Hopefully, will be at, at some point in the foreseeable future. There are um, there is an extended release baclofen that is in research uh, right now that hopefully will give us another option. There is an extended release form of amantadine. Amantadine is an old anti-influenza drug. Uh, that uh, we use sometimes to treat fatigue in MS. There was a study that showed that it, it may actually improve walking speed in a way kind of similar to dalfampridine or Empira. Uh, again, not quite ready for prime time yet, but but getting closer. So let's talk about Sativex for a minute. I mean, even if it, when it is approved, what happens with people who are working who may need to use this, but who get drug tested? That's, that's going to be a challenge. So, you know, once this thing gets FDA approval, and let's, so that requires that THC be taken off the Schedule 1 list, it's going to be very up to the employer, you know, at that point. It, and so, you know, I, I know that a lot of, um, like, for instance, our hospital, you know, we, in theory, have random drug testing, but we also have a policy in place that if you were, if you have a medical reason to be using THC, and it shows up in a random drug screen, and it truly was just a random drug screen. You're not impaired in any way. There's not going to be any any implication. You know, the problem uh, with THC is is it's going to stay in your system for quite a long time. So even if you are say just using a bedtime dose of THC for spasticity and spasms, you're not taking it in the workplace. That if you had a random drug screen the next afternoon, it's probably still going to show up in your drug screen. So the, there, that is a great question, and it's one that we're going to have to come up with some answers with. Um, I would expect that it's probably going to be very much employer dependent. I would imagine some jobs, you know, maybe law enforcement, you know, airline pilots, the, the, the threshold is probably going to be a lot different with different uh, occupations. Right. I would hope that employers in general would look at it like um, they know their employee goes out for lunch and has a beer, but it's okay to come back to work. So if it's okay, you know, as long as they're not impaired, then they should be able to do this. Um, I agree. So, yeah. yeah, I think I think the impairment is going to be the key. You know, if you're functioning, you're doing your job, you're fine. It was just a random drug screen. I would hope employers would take that into account. Okay, so going back to the Sativex, do you have any idea when it might be approved in the U.S.? So uh, we're wrapping up one phase three study right now. They need to do another phase three study. It it has been slow going. Um, I, I had thought that the recruitment for the Sativex trials would be really easy. Um, it, the way they've designed the trials, it's pretty tough to get individuals into these studies. And so um, it, I'm guessing a little bit here, but I would say probably at least two years out on that, which is a little frustrating because it, it should be just a slam dunk. We know it works. We know it's safe. We're just checking a box for the FDA that, you know, sadly, the FDA will not accept all the studies that have been done in multiple other countries that show that this stuff works. I mean, the stuff's been around for 12 years, and so it's it's got a long track record. Um, but I think just due to the regulatory challenges, it's just probably going to be a couple of years. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And thank you, Kevin, for asking. All right. So the next one is with regard to gait and being off balance, um, other than using medical drugs is there anything else that anybody can do yeah so so yeah and you know we we threw a lot of uh, props to the physical therapists and occupational therapists I just can't say enough about the absolute benefit of getting in with a good physical therapy team and making sure that you've seen a therapist that is familiar with ms and they can help you tease out you know of these five causes you know, which, which ones are you dealing with and how do we come up with a a plan. I, mean, I agree. We'd like to keep medications to a, a minimum. If we can do physical therapy, if we get you into a regular exercise program, stretching program, uh, I would much rather go that route. And then the devices, all the different devices, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the, the BioNest device or something else, you know, uh, to using those where appropriate. Okay, thank you. And uh, is it abnormal to have a leg tremor with your gait with MS? Not abnormal. Uh, and again, we, we'd want to kind of help tease out what does that tremor really represent? Is it a true tremor like you could see with cerebellar dysfunction or is it actually clonus, that bouncy leg? So a lot of people feel like they've got a tremor in their leg when what they've really got is a really exaggerated deep tendon reflex as a form of spasticity. 
and the treatment paths are going to be very different for those, those two things. In my experience, the clonus is way more common than, than true tremor in the leg. Okay, thank you. Next, a few more questions on gait. Uh, person writes, I have gait issues, but I also must consider prior reconstruction to main arch in right foot causing pain in toes and stabilize ankle. Um, what can be done about that? Yeah, I mean, that person raises a great point. I mean, just because you have MS doesn't mean you, you don't have other health issues. And so a lot of times we're dealing with the MS effects on the gait, and then someone that's got a bad knee, a bad ankle, you know, something, a, a foot problem. So again, you know, working with a physical therapist to sort out how much of each of these things the person is dealing with. A lot of physical therapists that are familiar working with MS are also going to be pretty comfortable working with some of the more ortho type issues. So, you know, our inserts going to be appropriate. A lot of our patients have hyperextension of the knee. One of the things they do to compensate for a weak leg is they're, they're actually hyperextending the knee and locking it so they don't fall. Um, it works, but it's really unhealthy for your knee. And so the what our physical therapist will do is make a knee cage so the person is not hyperextending and damaging their knee. And, you know, that's not really a direct MS thing, but it, it but it, you know, it certainly contributes to the gait, gait issues. Thank you. Last one on gait, I believe for the moment anyway. Does caffeine have a bad effect on gait problems? Not typically. I mean, a lot of people, because of fatigue and MS, a lot of people need that little caffeine boost. And, and you know, I, I've not seen it directly negatively affect gait. Do realize if you've got gait issues, when you drink that caffeine, you're probably going to have to pee pretty soon. And, it, you know, that uh, the caffeine definitely can kick off the urinary urgency and frequency. So it may not affect the gait, but it may accentuate your bladder issues. Great. Thank you for that. And from AAN, was there anything recently released on gait? Yeah, I'm trying to think if the, there was a po uh, paper on the um, the extended release of mantadine uh, for for walking that was presented. Um, I don't think that there was anything on on devices per se. So I think that was probably the big one. There's always a lot of physical therapy, you know, the stuff it, between AAN and the consortium of MS yeah. centers. Um, so yeah, the, they're always tweaking dif different uh, therapy approaches for gait. Sure, thank you for that. And then let's go to PT, physical therapy for a minute. Um, do you ever find that physical therapy does not help a person with multiple sclerosis? Yeah, it, it's rare, but we do sometimes see, the, you know, people that just have you know, such significant problems or you know, or they're not working with the right physical therapist. So it's, it's rare, but it, it, it does happen. Um, we see people that if just maybe they're already doing a great home exercise program they're already doing all the stretches um, again it's rare that someone can't uh, learn something from physical therapy but it, it it's possible that, that you can see a rare individual who doesn't get anything from PT okay and so are there any are there any is it realistic to expect being able to ambulate with the use of walking sticks or a cane from a walker with therapy depends upon where you're starting at. So I, mean, I know that's a common question we hear is, you know, what, what is your goal with physical therapy? I want to walk again. And I think that's a great goal. Is it a realistic goal? I, I, you know, I want it, I want that to happen for everybody who wants to walk again. You know, if you've been in a, if you've been completely non-ambulatory and in a power wheelchair for 15 years, that, that bar is a little higher than someone who's just had a relapse and they've just recently started having walking issues. But I think we want to give 110% to everybody and give everyone the best chance they can to, to walk again, whether it's you know unassisted or with some kind of assistive device. We have a gentleman who we is um, a big donor here at, at Shepherd Center, uh, who you know his goal was to walk 50 feet, and he had not walked that far in probably 10 years. Through persistence, aggressive physical therapy, uh, two weeks ago he walked 50 feet. He used bilateral canes to do it, but you know I, I think it's it's we want to be aggressive and never never give up. And if if the person themselves is committed, we'll, we should be committed right along with them. Okay, great, thank you for that. Next, we have we have can baclofen for leg cramps also cause urinary incontinence? This is by Ruth. Yeah, so so we have heard that. I don't think it's a common symptom, but it, you know, it is a muscle relaxant. And if you know, in theory, if it relaxed, you know, the bladder sphincter too much, I, I could see it potentially doing that. It's 
I would be skeptical if you know if, if I have someone on back open and they come in, their bladder has changed. I, I'm going to bet it's something other than the back open. Constipation a little more common with back open than than bladder changes. Okay, thank you. So Lucy writes, "Hooray! Now I also have RA. How do I handle both, especially the fatigue?" Um, so ideally, you, you you want your neurologist and your rheumatologist talking to one another. You know, there there may be therapies from at least from a disease modifying standpoint, therapies that are going to cover both those things. It'd be wonderful to be on one drug, have it cover both conditions. Um, you, it's it's going to be you know important that we try to separate out what's MS, what's you know, is this a joint pain issue that's limiting your walking, or is it? weakness and spasticity from your MS. Um, it's doable. I mean, we, we have a number of people that we work with that have both RA and MS, and, and I wouldn't say it's, it's you know, it hasn't been an impossible, you know, uh, thing to over, overcome in terms of sorting the symptoms out and picking one therapy that hopefully covers both, both the issues. Great, thanks. I have three questions left online about the topic, and then I have two questions on COVID, so we're going to go a little bit beyond the 815, okay? Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Person writes, Darlene writes, uh, does or do legs up on the wall exercise help to relieve spasms and decrease leg swelling? So anything that puts your feet above the level of your heart definitely is going to help with the swelling, and the longer you know the, the feet are up, the, the, the less the swelling is going to be. That's why most people with MS will say their, their feet look better in the morning than later in the day because they've had their, their feet up some and they're just taking a, a advantage of gravity. So you, when you've got the, the legs up like that, you're, you're stretching out the hamstrings. I wouldn't discourage you from doing it. It, it may not be the muscle you need to stretch though. So that's, that is an, a, you know, a flexor, I mean, a, a flexor muscle, and realize your spasticity is, is tends to be extensor in MS. So if your muscles want to extend in your legs, when you stretch, you want to go the opposite direction. The runner's stretch, where you grab the bottom of your leg on the front of, just above your foot, pull your heel back towards your butt, usually best done lying down or at least standing, supporting yourself, trying to get your, your heel back towards your, your butt. And that's going to really hit those, the quad muscles on the top. And then using the, the towel under the bottom of the foot, pulling your foot back towards yourself, it's going to hit that, that calf muscle or your gastroc muscle, which is the, probably the most commonly spasming muscle in a person with MS. Sure, thank you for that. Uh, before I uh, get to the last two questions and two, the other two questions, I just want to let anybody know that who happens to be in central Ohio, that MS Views and News will be there on May 21st doing a live program. Okay, so... Um, if you're interested, if you want to go, then I ask that you go to our website, please, and check it out and get registered to attend that program. It is um, on a lot of the topics that, you know, are just everyday need to know. Plus, we have a pelvic floor specialist that will be there to, to discuss the bladder issues, physical therapy, and whatever else she does, you know, for her own career. Okay, so I just want to let you know about that. All right, now. Uh, Michael has a question. Can there be a correlation between gait issues and and chronic pelvic floor pain? Yes. So if the mechanics of your gait is thrown off, again, it's going to put stress on the, the hips and sometimes that hip pain, and even the lower back pain, the sacroiliac pain, I mean, it can refer into to deeper structures in the pelvis. So that that is a possibility. Okay, thank you. All right, next, Emily writes... This is the last online question, and then we're going to get to a few of the COVID questions, okay? Um, uh, Emily writes, I'm going to Disney World this summer. Yay, Emily. All right. <laughs> Don't forget to see Mickey and Minnie, okay? Um, should I need to take a break during the day and take a nap to help with the heat exhaustion? Boy, I hope you're not there in August. Whew. Brutal. Yeah. So ideally, I think you you would try to set up your Disney trip so that you do it in little chunks and, and you know, and I think this is maybe true for everybody, especially if you're going with little kids. I mean, try to do it in, you know, three hour sections, go back, take a break, recharge your battery, cool off, you know, make sure you stay super well hydrated. Um, 
I'm a big believer in taking things that have the consistency of a sloppy, a slushy or, or slushy um, to, to drop your core body temperature. Uh, if they will let you bring a camelback into the park, that would be awesome. Camelback is that little backpack that's got a big bladder on the back and a little tube that comes over the front so that you could put uh, blended ice and water into that camelback. It's going to act like a cooling vest for you. You've got your super chilled liquid right there. If you can sneak in a pina colada or margarita, hats off to you for doing that. That counts as, as well. So, I hate to tell you, but it doesn't matter what you bring in that's cool, that you think is cool and is going to last long. When you're down in Disney and, uh, you know, and, and you're going to be in uh, probably 100 plus degree heat, you know, between heat and humidity, it's only going to last a half hour. Yeah. And then you still have yeah. to carry that thing around with you all day. So that's true. That's true. Too. Right. 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 And you, know, this, you know, this, I, I just have to add one more thing onto that for a lot of people that um, are resistant to using a mobility device. That might be something that you should think about doing. And yes, I mean, I, I'm I'm the king for that. I mean, there's no way, you know, there. I just I don't want to give in. But sometimes, especially when you get halfway through a big Anything you're going to want something to help you get the rest of the way, right? So um, the front of the line, if you got a mobility device as well, say that again, please. Don't you get to go to the front of the yes. line? Yes. 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 You get to go to the front of the line with mobility devices. Yes. yes. And that's a great help too. So. Yes. All right. So a person just wrote an interesting question. Okay. Um, is this webinar available anywhere after it's finished? Yes. In a week or thereabouts. Okay. That's what I said before. So. Um, yes, I'm sorry that you just arrived, um, but um, this will be online in either a week or just under a week, and that's all I could say for right now. It'll be put onto our YouTube channel, and we will send out an email to everybody that was online tonight, including anybody that came in late online tonight, that uh, they will know that it is on our YouTube channel, and that's you know, unfortunately the best I could do right now because we have a lot of programs that we do each month, and so there's a timeline of getting things done. All right. So two last questions, and these are COVID related. One, should people with MS still consider getting a vaccine if they've never had one and or for those that have had and even were boosted, should they get boosted again? So I think yes on both of those. So the data says, you know, that the vaccines do offer protection. Um, you know, the, the, the challenge is that the virus is changing. It, you know, the Omicron variant is, picked up a lot of genetic information from other coronaviruses. The BA2 variant that is a subvariant of Omicron, you know, is, is, is not what we were dealing with originally. And, you know, the, the only weaknesses of our vaccines is they were designed for the original COVID and they, they worked really well for Delta. Our virus is changing a little bit, but the, the, the data still says that you're less likely to end up in the hospital um, or in the ICU or, or dead if you've been vaccinated. Um, if you're not sure if you have immunity or not, it'll say you've had COVID, you've had vaccination, you've had some combination thereof, you can have your, your doctor do COVID antibody testing to see if, you, if you've got antibodies still. Um, yeah, so I think it's still a good idea um, I well, and I don't know what the last question was, but I'll, I'll throw in here that the, the the special group of individuals that we really need to think about are people on people people with MS who might be on a therapy that would affect their ability to make antibodies to either natural infection or to vaccination. And these are going to be your B cell therapies, so Ocrevus, Rituxan, Truxema, Casempta. Um, these. Uh, Therapies are wonderful for, for MS, but they can be associated with a lower risk of or lower likelihood of you making antibodies. So we are offering those individuals and individuals on S1P drugs. These are your that's would be Gelenia, Ponvori, uh, Mazent, and Zaposia. We are offering those individuals a product called Evusheld. Evusheld is an FDA authorized COVID monoclonal antibody that was designed to treat severe COVID cases, but it can be also used to prevent COVID. So Evusheld is not a vaccine, it is passive antibodies. We're just saying 
here, have some immunity. And so I really like to offer that to, especially the B cell therapy uh, patients. So if you're on one of those B cell therapy drugs that we mentioned, talk to your healthcare team about potentially getting a dose of Evusheld. It's an intramuscular injection, one in each hip. It should give you coverage for somewhere between six and nine months. Uh, it's not a vaccine. You're not going to feel crummy afterwards. We're not asking your immune system to do anything. The biggest challenge that we have with Evusheld is availability. Um, it is not in high supply. We, st we struggle here, and I think every MS center in the country is struggling to get all that we want. We will ask for 200 doses. We'll get 50 doses. And uh, for instance, this week, just yesterday, we ran out. We we're hoping we get more sometime in the next couple of, of days here. You know, if you go to your MS center and you're in one of those groups we talked about, B cell therapy, S1P therapy, and, uh, and you want Evusheld and they don't have it, talk to them about you. Like for our patients today, I'm saying call back next week, we'll do a nurse visit, uh, you will have it then, give it to you then. But yeah, that's, definitely know about Evusheld and, and ask your healthcare team about it. Okay, well, I can't ask the second question because you answered it. And then when I had a third question, you already answered that. And then even a fourth and you answered it as well. And it all had to do with Evusheld. All right, and Evusheld Ev, Ev, is, pe uh, people are asking me how to spell it. E is in Echo, V is in Victor, U as an Umbrella, S in Sierra, H as in Hotel, E is in Echo, L as in, uh, I forgot the word for it. Lima. We'll say, uh, Lima. say that again. Lima. Lima, there we go. And D is in Delta. That's pretty good, though. I missed one letter. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, so, um, we are going to close out this program, though a person did tell me that the Disney people took away the right to just go up to the front because people ah. were abusing it. But 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 I still remember that if you call ahead, that there's some way for you to get into a line that is some kind of call ahead. And um, you have to work that out with the park. So, you know, get in touch with your travel agent or call the park directly. All right. And um a uh, person is writing again about Evasheld. Uh, should people get another dose after six months of Evasheld? I would check the antibodies and see what your antibodies are and see if you know, if it's sticking around longer than six months. Just because of the availability issues, it, it's possible it may stick around months more than that. Great. So I do want to thank everybody for being online. I do thank everybody for all the kudos that you gave the doctor, that you gave me, that you gave everybody that puts these programs together. So I am saying toodles and doctor have a great night take care everybody bye bye